Okay, so, welcome back. Um, right, so we've kind of finished a broad arc in this course uh, that I was kind of setting up from the beginning and finished with our discussion of social construction, uh, broadly trying to motivate the idea that there's both values influence on science, especially in the sense of deciding which questions we ask and how we ask them, but that nonetheless science can come up with uh, reliable and in some sense objective knowledge uh, in the sense that it's at least intersubjectively reliable. So that was kind of the point of that, the course so far. Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit now. So uh, the rest of the course is basically just taking a look at a couple of uh, various issues in philosophy of science. Uh, today we're going to shift to doing more philosophy-ish philosophy, so less We've been doing a kind of integrated history and philosophy of science largely for the course, so lots of sort of interest in actual scientific practice and that sort of thing. Now, at least today, we're going to start talking about kind of more pure philosophy of science. Uh, so we're going to take a step back historically, start talking about stuff that happened in the 40s in philosophy of science, and move on to more modern stuff. Uh, specifically, we're going to start talking about explanation. Uh, one of my favorite topics in philosophy of science is something I dealt with a lot in my PhD thesis. So, um, we, if we think about what we want out of science, so consider what, what we're after. Um, we want to be able to predict things, of course. You want to be able to know what's going to happen next. Uh, but you also want some capacity, and I, want, I, I would insist that these are two different things. You also want to be able to explain things. So if you think about how long it's been the case that we were able to predict that the sun was going to rise tomorrow, I mean, we've been able to predict that for ever. I mean, as long as we've been able to predict things, we've been able to predict that the sun would rise tomorrow. But when would, when would you say that we have a correct explanation for that fact? Like, me, not, yeah, yeah, I mean, So like, sorry, so when, when did we learn how to explain that the sun's rising tomorrow? Like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but that's the prediction part. That's the, so yeah. this is, yeah, so this is, I mean, there's the prediction that it's gonna come up tomorrow, which we've been very reliably right about for a very, very long time. Probably before language we had this figured out, yeah. the signs of like egocentrism and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's what our, I would I would roughly put it. There might be some gray areas there where like Copernicus had a, you know, here's why the sun rises. It's because the earth is spinning round and round. I take it that that's the correct explanation roughly. Um, so we didn't have that until 500 years ago, something like that. So there's this vast difference between being able to, historically at least, being able to predict that the sun's gonna rise and actually understanding why it rises. Like we had previous explanations, one of which was that it, the sun is spinning around and around us, or that the chariots of the gods are dragging it across the heavens. That was a previous explanation. I take it those are attempts at explanation, but we might want to require that our explanations be true. Like a cor an explanation in some sense is a, cor uh, it's a success term, right? You say you've, explain something when your explanation is both good and true, rather than just trying to explain, yeah? Uh, so let's distinguish prediction from explanation. Explanation, you might say you have explanations when you understand something in some deep way. So there's this, typically there's a, an, a connection made between explanation and understanding. Um, and philosophers have spent a whole bunch of time and energy trying to understand specifically scientific explanations. Uh, that there might be something different about scientific explanations than other kinds of explanations. Uh, not just sort of pseudoscientific explanations, but the style of explanation that scientists are interested in seems to be different than other types of explanation. So let me give you a contrast for scientific explanation, which is something like historical explanation. Um, okay, now, I don't want to insist that 
historical explanation has to be, have this character. But I'll tell you as a matter of fact, the kind of explanation that professional academic historians have been interested in since like the 70s or 80s or something like that uh, has been less focused on grand overarching theories of history. Uh, something happened in the 70s where historians noticed that their explanations had a specific character, they call it Whig history, where you know, they, they developed these grand historical stories that basically had the, the narrative structure of Europe saves the universe, uh, that the grand march of history was all heading towards the modern European nation state, and that that's where it was all leading the whole time. Uh, they noticed that their stories had this character and got really uncomfortable with that fact, uh, probably rightly so, uh, A, because it was politically bad, and B, because it was simply distorting how things happen. Like, that's not how history works. It doesn't head specifically towards some outcome. It's things happen, and there's a bunch of reasons why they happen. So uh, they got really nervous about these grand historical narratives and started telling historical stories that were very specific in their time and place. So a historian now will focus on like medical history in Italy in 1450 to 1470 in this specific social class or something like that, right? They'll get these really, really specific things that they want to explain and the style of explanation that historians tend to use, again, this is not a fact of nature, this is just the historians that I hang out with, uh, they want to understand things, not by trying to fit them into kinds and categories of events. What they want to do is understand all of the detailed specifics of that moment in time and space. They understand the event more deeply by layering in more and more context so that you can see what's absolutely unique about that thing that they're trying to understand. Uh, so, this is a way of explaining and understanding the world. It's a kind of contextual, specific, uh, focused, and detailed way of understanding. And the explanations they give are kind of long, detailed stories about that time and place. Um, and I want to suggest that this contrasts with the way that scientists are typically interested in explaining and understanding things. So in scientific explanation, the tendency is to be focused more on understanding the similarities between different things than understanding one thing in its kind of complex context. So every single snowflake is of course unique, but that's the uniqueness of the snowflake is not what somebody who's doing a scientific study on it wants to understand. They want to understand the general regularities of all snowflakes. What are the rules of construction that snowflakes follow? Uh, what are the general principles that describe their geometry? These are the kind of things that scientists try to understand. So their explanations are not pitched at the level of why does this specific snowflake have this specific structure? Uh, it's an extreme example, but I think it kind of carries over. Uh, scientific explanation is typically more interested in the general features of the world rather than zooming in and getting the very detailed understanding of one specific thing. Does that, does that contrast make some sense? Okay, good. So again, these are not, I mean, it's not a fact of, it's not a fact about nature that these different disciplines have to have these different interests, but there's certainly a actual fact about what these groups are interested in today. Uh, and that seems to be the distinction. So, yeah. Maybe it's the difference between memorizing all the code for a piece of software versus knowing the principles of how to code. Something like that, and, yeah. And knowing the principles of how to code would be more valuable than just memorizing an individual piece of software. Well, it depends what you're interested in, right? Um, like, I take it that these are two different ways of processing the world, actually. So there's different, there's different styles of understanding, and each style of understanding is more appropriate for some context than for others. So for example, when you're dealing with human beings on a one-to-one -one basis, you probably don't want to go, ah, well, here are the general categories that you fall under, and I'm going to just understand you in terms of those general categories. Most people, if you're dealing with somebody in a one-to-one -one basis, prefer for you to be interested in the specifics and details of their actual life, right? Like, you don't want to just reduce somebody to a category. You want them to meet you as 
a unique individual with unique properties that have to be understood in terms of your life history and context. I don't. That's how I prefer to be to be met and understood. So depending on your project, depending on your interests, one or one or the other of those styles of understanding might be more appropriate. And we kind of mix and match them, right? So it's not the case that all scientific explanation is purely general. I mean, if you're doing paleontology, you're interested in history. Uh, if you're doing some types of history, you're interested in generalities. But this is, a, this is the broad trend, and there are these two sort of semi-separate but interacting ways of getting at the world. And today we're gonna talk about just one of them. We're really gonna focus on the scientific style or the general style of explanation, okay? Okay, so as I said, scientific explanation tends to be interested in classes and categories, right? You wanna find the kinds of things and understand the kind of thing that you're looking at. A political scientist, for example, this kind of science, might wanna to try to understand revolutions in general, right? So political revolutions, say, under what conditions do revolutions arise? And to understand that and to, to answer that question, what you do is try to find all the conditions that are similar across revolutions in history, right? And then if you have that, maybe you'll be able to do things like predict future revolutions and understand the causes and factors that lead to one coming about. Uh, whereas a historian, somebody in a more historical mode, doesn't want to understand, so they say they're looking at the French Revolution, they don't want to understand the similarity between the French Revolution and all the other revolutions. They want to understand that moment, what exactly was going on in France at that time uh, in a kind of very detailed way without really worrying too much about whether it generalizes. So it's about the difference between understanding the class, kind, or category of thing that you're interested in versus trying to understand this specific object. Okay, so, uh, and the way that this has usually been formulated uh, by philosophers of science is trying to understand things in terms of the laws of nature. So for most of the 20th century, philosophers assumed that scientific knowledge takes the form of laws of nature. And the assumption was that they'd be universal laws of nature. We've had some debate about that since, but for our purposes, this is a good place to start. So uh, laws have the form, the following form, all members of the category X have the property Y. That's a universal claim. It's a claim about all members of the category, and it's attributing to all members of the category some property. Yeah? So all copper is conductive. That's a classic, for philosophers, that's a classic law of nature. Or all electrons have negative charge, all massive objects attract, attract each other gravitationally. These are the kind of laws that philosophers are interested in, and you can see how they are categorical in the sense that they try to understand the properties of a category. Okay, um, just saying that it's got this form is probably not sufficient. So just having universal form doesn't make something a law of nature. Philosophers spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the extra secret sauce is, but uh, here's the problem. So compare the following three claims, and they're all, they all have that universal form. They all attribute to all members of a category the property. So there are no spheres of uranium bigger than one kilometer in diameter. And I'm pretty confident that that one's true. I've never been to most of the universe, but if you put that much uranium all in one place, it explodes, right? Like it has a very strong tendency to undergo a nuclear reaction. So you can't have a, you can't have a sphere big of uranium bigger than one kilometer. Okay. Uh, probably there's also no spheres of gold bigger than one kilometer in diameter. I don't know of any. Um, but I can't say the same, I can't say that with the same certainty because there's no law, I don't think this one is a law of nature. Some bizarrely motivated alien species could go around and collect just an unbelievable amount of gold and put it all into a sphere. It's not impossible in the same way. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a very, yeah, the, the, there's no naturally occurring ones, very probable, 
But again, there's a, there's a sort of difference in character here where one's very unlikely and one is just not going to happen. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Well, like if you studied all the asteroids in the universe, you might find one that just has a ridiculous amount of gold in it. It could, I mean, it's extremely unlikely. Um, but even if both of the, so let's, for the, for the minute, for, the, for, for now, let's assume that both of these are actually true. I think it's not unreasonable to say that there's probably no spheres of gold bigger than a kilometer. But one of them has to be true. And one of them kind of happens to be true. Uh, consider this one. All the coins in Corey's pocket on March 9th are quarters. I, sh I should have brought some quarters to make this true. This is, I have no change in my pocket right now. But suppose I've got a couple of quarters in my pocket. That sentence is true of the entire class or category of things that it's describing. Um, but that could definitely be some other way, right? Like if I put a loonie in my pocket, it wouldn't suddenly turn into a quarter. So all of these have got the structure that I just described. So it's attributing, so all members of the category X have the property Y. Uh, if you put these in uh, logical form, they actually apply to every object in the universe because they say, if something is a coin in Corey's pocket on March 9th, then it is a quarter. And that's true of literally every object of the universe. You say, that's the chair. It's not a coin in Corey's pocket. Therefore, it's true that if it's a coin, then it's a quarter, that kind of thing. So these, in, in the kind of logical form that philosophers like to count, or phrase these things, these are all true of literally every object in the universe, but only the top one, only this one about uranium, seems to have the sometimes talk about the modal force of a law of nature. Laws of nature are not supposed to be coincidentally true generalizations. They're supposed to be things that have to be true. Not in a logical sense, but in a physical, the, the physical properties of the universe preclude something from being a uranium sphere bigger than a kilometer. Whereas there's nothing in the laws of nature, as far as I can tell, that requires that there can't be a one kilometer sphere of gold or that I could have a coin in my pocket that's not a quarter. That one I'm very confident about. Yeah? So these laws are supposed to be universal generalizations, and they're supposed to have this kind of sort of necessity. So this is the thing that philosophers, we don't, I won't spend too much time troubling you about this, but trying to characterize what, what property this top one has that these other two don't has been a bone of contention uh, because if you're an empiricist, if you believe that all of our knowledge comes through our senses, uh, all you ever observe is something never happening. Yeah? Like, I never see any gold spheres bigger than a kilometer. Right? That's a, tr that's a true observation. And you don't see the necessity of this, of this uranium thing. Right? It's not something you, necessity is not something you can observe. You just see that it never happens. So. Trying to, trying to describe what makes one of these necessary, an actual law, and the other two not laws is, we've been working on it. It's, there's some debate. Okay, so there's laws of nature. Uh, the classic view of scientific explanation is that your explanation should involve a law of nature of this form. So uh, I'd like to introduce you to the deductive nomological account of explanation. Uh, so Carl Hempel and Paul Oppenheim uh, wrote this up in the 40s, mid 40s, presented this as a trying to kind of very clearly say what counts as a scientific explanation. And the, basics, the basic idea is a scientific explanation deduces the thing that you want explained from a law of nature and some initial conditions. Yeah? So uh, what an explanation does is take a law of nature and some specific facts about the world and then deduces the thing you want explained from that pair. That's what makes something a good scientific explanation. Uh, here's, the, here's the general form of it. There's a condition or fact, there's a general law, and then you just deduce that from that, from the conditional condition or in general law. Uh, in the lit explanation literature, we separate the parts of an explanation into explanands and explanandum. I won't make you memorize that, but this is if you want to refer to the thing you want explained, that's the explanandum, and the thing doing the explaining is the explanands. Okay, 
So here's an example very similar to the one uh, Hempel and Oppenheim give. So the explanandum is why did the pipes in my house burst? So you go to your kitchen and you see water pouring out uh, and you say, why, why? Well, here's a condition, here's a fact of the world. The pipes are made of metal and they're filled with water and it's freezing. So you're allowed to give yourself several facts, but like metal pipes, water in them, freezing cold. And here's two general laws. When water freezes, it expands. When metal gets cold, it contracts. And you can put those facts and those rules together to get that the pipes are going to break. Uh, Hempel's one was like a radiator, but I don't know if I think it's more familiar now than having a radiator filled with water. OK, so this is what a scientific explanation is, according to Hempel and Oppenheim. Here's the picture. Here's what it is to explain something scientifically. You take some facts, you take some laws, and you use them to deduce the thing that you're interested in. Yeah? Pretty good, right? And then we figured it out, and it was all over, and nobody talked about it again. Hey, like it always happens in philosophy. We just come straight to the correct answer, and then nobody talks about it anymore. Okay, not really. All right. Um, okay, so that was their kind of first pass at this, the deductive nomological account. Deductive in that you deduce things, nomological in that it's law-based. Um, of course, a lot of our scientific knowledge is not universal in that way, right? The, the laws of nature that I just showed you are kind of exceptions because most of our scientific knowledge takes the form of statistical facts. We know something happens a lot of the time, or most of the time, or regularly, something like that. Uh, so they, did, they developed a second model to kind of handle this second style of laws of nature, the inductive statistical method. So instead of deducing the thing to explain, what you get is, so in a, in a deduction, if you haven't done sort of philosophy stuff, in deductions, you get the conclusion with certainty. So if the premises are true, the conclusion is certain to be true. In induction, what you say is, if the premises are true, then the conclusion is likely to be true. So you get a high probability, or something like that. So uh, why, so you drop a, suppose you got a tank of water and you drop an ink drop in it. And you want to know, and it spreads out. You say, why does that happen? Why does the ink spread out? And you can give a really good statistical answer to this. So if you characterize the number of possible states of the system, so all of the ways that the ink can be distributed, there's just way, way more ways in which it's evenly distributed than if it's like clumped up in one little spot. So if you say the system is randomly chugging through states, uh, it's just going to go to some random state. There's almost infinitely more states in which it's randomly and evenly distributed than there are states in which it's clumped up in, in one corner or something. So if you drop an ink drop in a thing of water and it all zooms to just one spot, that's super weird. It's not impossible. Statistically speaking, there is, there, that is a thing that it could do, um, but it's exceptionally unlikely. This is, by the way, the same kind of explanation that you'd give if you want to know why is the air in this room roughly evenly distributed? Like why isn't it all pressed down against the floor or like against one wall? The answer is because there's just way, way, way more ways for it to be roughly evenly distributed than there are for it to be pressed up against one wall. And the system is just randomly going through states. In, if, you, if you sat in this room for a trillion, trillion, trillion years, maybe for one second, it would be unevenly distributed. It would mostly be on this side as it just kind of randomly goes through its states. But you can get that the air is not going to do that with extremely high probability by doing this kind of statistical explanation. OK, so good. We've got the deductive account for things that are always true. We've got the inductive account for things that are mostly or usually true. Yeah? So, so in that situation, wouldn't the vacuum created destroy the room? Maybe. It could only be, it could happen for a split second and not destroy the room. I don't know. It's extremely, I, I'm not super worried about what would happen because it's so hilariously unlikely to happen. We could sit here for many times the age of the universe and it would never happen. But, yeah. If you're laying in bed waiting, worried at night, 
that the air might all suddenly rush to one side of your room. It's, you'll be fine, don't worry. Okay. Okay, so let's do some problems with this. So this, this was the kind of first pass at this stuff, comes out in the 40s. People pretty quickly noticed that there are some issues with both of these accounts. So uh, I started by saying that there's some big difference between explanation and prediction. Hempel actually just goes ahead and denies this. He says, no, 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 that's basically the same thing. Because if you can deduce that something's gonna happen, then you've got a prediction that it's gonna happen. The only real difference between an explanation and a prediction for Hempel is that in an explanation, the thing has already happened, whereas in a prediction, it's still in the future. That's it. That's the only difference. Um, but that produces some weird results for his view. Uh, for example, the famous flagpole. So uh, if I want an explanation, so we've got a flagpole, and we've got the sun, and the flagpole's casting a shadow. So, on Hempel's account, you can explain the length of the shadow by citing the specific position of the sun and then some universal laws about geometry. You just, your, your you know, grade A geometry lets you predict how long that shadow is going to be. Um, but you can do this the other way as well. Suppose you ask, why is the sun where it is? I want an explanation for the position of the sun in the sky. Well, I know the length of the shadow and the height of the flagpole, and I know some geometry, and I can deduce where the sun is. Now, it's perfectly fine to say you can predict where the sun is based on those facts. That's no worry. But can you explain, based on, so say, can you explain to me why the sun is right there? And you say, well, there's a flagpole, it's this high, and there's a shadow, and it's this long. Therefore, that's why the sun is where it is. That's, that's weird, right? That's not why the sun is where it is. But on Hempel's account, that comes out as a good explanation. As good as the other way around. Like, I'm, we're all happy with like, why is the shadow that long? Like, well, the sun's there and the flagpole's this high. Why is the sun there? You shouldn't, no facts about the flagpole are helpful for understanding why the sun is where it is, right? Predicting, yes. Explaining, people are like, no, 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 no. That's not, that's not gonna work. Okay, so the famous flagpole example, uh, people get pretty worried about that. Uh, they also get worried about things being cited that are kind of irrelevant. So here's John Jones. John Jones does not have a uterus. But every day, John Jones takes a birth control pill. And John Jones does not get pregnant. Good for him. He's very careful. He's very cautious. He's got no uterus, but he does take birth controls. John Jones fails to get pregnant. Well, here's a good, here's a good deductive explanation for that. Anybody who doesn't have a uterus and takes birth control pills will not get pregnant. John Jones does not have a uterus. He takes birth control pills. Therefore, he does not get pregnant. <laughs> it's not recommended. <laughs> okay, it's not, recommended. it's not generally recommended. Um, yeah, but if you're going to ask why does John Jones not get pregnant, the birth control pills aren't really a super important part of the story, right? I mean, maybe the problem is that his boyfriend is infertile. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's okay. So. Uh, you can cite, so following Hempel's model to the letter, you can cite stuff that's irrelevant. You can put it into the story and it still counts as part of the explanation. Yeah. So you're, you can cite irrelevancies. Uh, another example that he uses, uh, crit critics of Hempel use, every morning I have a cup of coffee and I say a magical ritual over it and then I drink the coffee and it wakes me up. Therefore, have, saying a magical ritual over my coffee and drinking it is responsible for, explains why the coffee wakes me up. You're like, yeah, no, it doesn't. You can deduce it, right? So there's a very strong regularity. Every time you drink a cup of coffee that you set a little magical ritual over, it does wake you up. So that's a universal regularity. 
You can say a law of nature about it if you want, but that's not, that's not an explanation. Okay, so um, diagnosing these problems, uh, philosopher said, okay, here's what you messed up, Hempel. Here's what you left out. Uh, you can't just cite the universal laws to explain something. You need to cite the causes of that thing, right? You have to cite the things that caused it to happen. That's the problem with these, these examples, right? What you're citing are true universal regularities, but you're not citing the causes of things. So yeah, you can explain the length of the shadow by citing the position of the sun and the height because they caused the length of the shadow. That's what caused the shadow to be where it is, the sun and the flagpole and geometry, I guess. But the length of the shadow doesn't cause the sun to do anything, right? There's no, if you somehow manipulate the length of the shadow, you're not manipulating the sun, right? So that's the problem with that example. They say, look, you cited a universal regularity, but you didn't cite the causes. You're going to explain stuff. You've got to tell me what caused it. That's the critique. Uh, and again, you can't explain why John Jones fails to get pregnant. Uh, because that's not what caused it. That's not the causal story about John Jones not getting pregnant. Uh, if he hadn't taken the pills, he still wouldn't have gotten pregnant. So this is one of the tests that you do for something being a cause. If it's there, then you get the effect. If you take it away, then you shouldn't get the effect anymore, right? Uh, and similar problems appear for the inductive statistical explanations. You get similar issues. So let me. Uh, I don't expect that I can do this better than the, the article. Uh, right, so this is an old-timey example. I don't think syphilis gets talked a lot about anymore, but here's the, here's the classic example. Oh, no, there was a syphilis outbreak this semester. <laughs> oh, God. Campus. Okay. Okay, <laughs> then this is topical. All right. <laughs> All right. So the town mayor suffers from a motor deficiency characterized by the limitation of certain movements and a loss in muscular strength, which is called paresis. And we know roughly a quarter of patients with untreated latent syphilis are victim to paresis. And we know that the mayor has precisely such latent syphilis, a condition he was not aware of and was constantly not having, consequently not having treated. Intuitively, what we have here is an explanation of the mayor's paresis, right? Why did the mayor have this muscular condition? Because he had syphilis. However, the law linking syphilis to paresis only brings the and the fact that the, the mayor's got syphilis only brings the mayor's probability up to 25%. And the inductive statistical account doesn't tell us exactly what counts as high probability, but 25% doesn't sound about, doesn't sound right. Yeah? That doesn't sound like a high probability. It's actually odds are lower than even that he's gonna get this condition. So inductive statistical account said, you explain something by showing how it was very likely. I mean, the ink blot thing is, the ink spreading in water is unimaginably likely. It's so close to 100% probable that there's kind of no difference. But this time, it's like less than half. It's a quarter. Nonetheless, it seems like we can explain why he has paresis based on citing the fact that he's got untreated syphilis. Yeah? Can you? Would, would it depend on there being another way of explaining? Like, like if there was another medical condition that could... Well, in this scenario, so supposing this scenario, this is the cause of his paresis. Okay. It, we know for a fact that this cause, that syphilis caused his paresis. Yeah? So if what we want out of our explanations is the causes, then this is fine as an explanation. And it, intuitively, most people say, yeah, that's a good explanation. Why has why this guy got paresis? Because he had untreated syphilis. But on the inductive statistical account, this doesn't work as an explanation, because you're supposed to get out that it's got a high probability. So that's weird, right? It's worrisome for the inductive statistical account. 
Ja. 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 Good. Okay. So interesting. Now, what you've done is shift the explanandum there. So you say, why is it the case that 25 people, so if there's 100 people in town with syphilis, why is it the case that there's 25 people with paresis? Now you've got this nice statistical explanation. 25% of cases develop into paresis, therefore, and you've got 100 cases, therefore it's very likely that 25 people will have it. Yeah, so if you shift the thing you're trying to explain to the population, then that works nicely, yeah. Um, but if we're just interested in the mayor, then the inductive statistics, it seems like intuitively, it should still explain why this one specific guy got paresis, and it doesn't seem to do that. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, so all of the examples I've shown you so far are pretty neatly resolved by just looking at the causes. You say, how do you explain something? Well, you cite the causes that brought it, brought it about. Ta-da. Pretty good, right? Um, so, but that gets us into some weird and tricky issues. Uh, so, like, what, is, what does it mean for one thing to cause another thing? Turns out there's a humongous debate about this. Um, especially in complex cases. Yeah, yeah. One of the issues that like something always causes another thing to like cause an effect. So you might know how snow is caused, temperature and stuff. But mm. then you have to ask why. Like if there's another. Once does, you know how snow is made, you like ask why does water freeze, and then figure that out, and then why. It's like you just you keep going. There is. Like, there is, there is this, this is how people end up being philosophers. They do this like, why is, okay, so why is it, why does snow create it? Oh, because water freezes. Why does water freeze? Because chemical properties. Why does it have those chemical properties? And then eventually you get to metaphysical questions and A, people stop talking to you and B, you end up doing philosophy degree. Uh, so careful, careful about that. Yeah. In order to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first recreate the universe. Quoth Carl Sagan, very good. Yeah. That, was, that was my best Carl Sagan impersonation, <laughs> which isn't, it wasn't that great. Okay, but even absent this kind of regressive why questions, we've got serious and difficult questions about assigning causes to things that we're pretty sure happened. So what, are, what would you say are the causes of the weather today? I mean, you obvious things, there's pressure, there's season, there's geography, um, but what we know about weather is that it's unimaginably sensitive to small changes. So if you make an incredibly tiny difference 100 years ago, it, or even 10, 10 days ago sometimes, it translates into big, big changes in the overall system. So this is one of the things we learn by studying weather simulations, for example. When you run a weather simulation and you change one variable at the like 10th significant digit, you run it for a little while, it very quickly diverges to some other state. Yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah. So this is the sometimes called the butterfly effect. Uh, and it's the idea that a butterfly flaps its wings in the Andes and then two weeks later there's rain instead of sun across the world. And that's, I mean, so it's a general property of complex nonlinear dynamical systems that that's going to be true, or at least some class of them, and we're pretty confident that it's true of the weather. So if you want to ask, okay, so what's the weather, why is the weather the way it is today? You might have to talk about the weather on Jupiter 10 years ago. You might have to talk about an errant comet passing beyond the bounds of our solar system. Like, you might have to talk about random quantum mechanical fluctuations in the sun. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah but also, like, you say that, like, we miss something, so, like, it's a totally different the factors we have to be considered. Yeah, yeah, so the, the number of factors and the number of factors, if you say, I want to explain something, okay, great, so just cite the causes. Well, that makes the explanation 
very quickly expand out to include the whole history of the universe, which is kind of inconvenient. I take it that, I mean, the assumption in this is that, um, my assumption is typically that an explanation is something that a human being could give or receive, right? Explanation is something that we do amongst people, and if you have to cite the entire history of the universe since the Big Bang, that's not going to work for us in any practical sense, right? I take it that scientific explanation is something that we can do. And if it's suddenly the case that, okay, we figured out that it's got to be causes, but now we just figured out that we can't explain anything because you'd have to describe the entire history of the universe. That's kind of worrying. Um, so Hempel notices this, actually. And one way, of, one way of dealing with this is to just say, look, uh, we got too many causes. The real explanation of any event is actually infinitely complex or practically, for, for our practical purposes, it's infinitely complex. And that all that you've ever received or given are what you might call explanation sketches. Tiny, tiny, tiny little slices of the real explanation, something like that. Um, yeah, so it's a, weird, it's a weird philosopher's move that they get kind of pushed into here. So this, you, you, you start out from, hey, people explain things. I, I know that, you know that, we explain things. Explain things all the time. Uh, how does that work? Well, here's a story. Okay, that story doesn't work. Here's another story. That story has the consequence that that thing that we started off trying to understand is kind of impossible. Um, in the sense that you can't ever actually explain, so you can't give the whole explanation for anything. All you can ever give is the tiniest infinitesimal fraction of the explanatory story. Um, I don't know how you. I don't know how you feel about that. I'm a little uncomfortable with this as a move to sort of turn something very normal and ordinary into something inconceivably complex and unrelated to any human activity. I don't know, you could be okay with that. Yeah, yeah. When you were talking about that drawing, I was like, which one is the um, complex? <laughs> <laughs> so this is, yeah, this is the human activity, this end of the front end of the horse. And then the back end is what the universe is like. It's got much more detail and complexity than I mean, this is what happened, would happen if I tried to draw a horse, the front, the front half. Okay, yeah, yeah. But you, okay, so you could have a reverse situation where like, like the truth is, is stranger, or sorry, sometimes fiction is stranger than truth, where you have a very boring event that's exaggerated in a way to appear more complex than what actually happened in reality. Okay, that's a possibility, but that's not what's what happening okay. here, right? Okay. All right, okay. Okay, so uh, causes as explanatory. Um, they got some issues. There's some serious questions about um, whether this story is acceptable, uh, they kind of hang on what you mean by cause. So maybe you're willing to consider something much smaller as the cause of today's weather. So you might say, look, I'm not going to talk about the weather on Jupiter 10 years ago. That's not part of the story. It's not a big enough factor or an interesting enough factor, something like that. But now we have to be sort of somewhat more selective. Once again, our interests have kind of come back into the story. Once again, we've sort of been unable to get this clear, I mean, what Hempel was going for was a clear objective criteria for what counts as an explanation. The story he told us was too simple, and as soon as you start trying to complexify it, our, what we're interested in gets back into the story. Um, and we'll, I'll develop this a little more next time. We'll talk a little bit more about causes, what counts as a cause, what counts as a causal explanation. We'll also talk a little bit about whether all scientific explanations have to cite causes. So it might be the case that there are non-causal explanations. So that's our topic for next time. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks everyone.